Well, good morning, or good evening, or good afternoon. Whenever you're watching this video, we hope that uh, you will find it worshipful, that it will be a blessing to you. I pray God is blessing you today and in the days that you have been safely tucked away at home. Uh, we want to welcome you to this Palm Sunday edition of our virtual worship. Today is, in fact, Palm Sunday, and it would be a day where you would be greeted with a palm at the door and an uh, invitation to sing a song and to wave your palm in the air as we uh, shout Hosanna to the Lord. So we have an interactive way for us to begin virtual worship today. We've got uh, a, a cadence that we would normally use, a call to worship in the midst of this service where I as the leader would say, Hosanna to the Son of David. And then you in the congregation would say, Hosanna in the highest. You want to try that? Let's give it a shot. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You want to try that with me? Let's try that. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I know it might feel strange, but I'm glad that if you're uh, standing up in your house and shouting Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, may you shout Hosanna on this Palm Sunday and praise the Lord as we welcome and commemorate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We are welcomed into the atmosphere of our virtual worship today through the words of Psalm 118. Psalm 118 gives us the, the bedrock of our hosannas and shouting. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 118. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I call on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in mortals. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. It is the day of the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. This Palm Sunday is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Let us... Pray the Holy Spirit into our lives in this moment together. Gracious and loving God, we come before you in the mighty and the powerful and the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
Lord, our voices echo with Hosanna as we enter into your sanctuary. May God's blessing fall upon us. May your Holy Spirit dwell richly with us, connecting our hearts one with another, overcoming distance, overcoming quarantine, overcoming walls and separation to knit us together as your people, the body of Christ. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit afresh on us that we may feel your Spirit moving in our hearts, that they would be strangely warmed, that we would sense your movement in our minds, that we might be truly inspired, that you would take hold of our lives, Lord, and transform us to your glory this day and forevermore. Hosanna in the highest. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We come to the communion rail on our knees in prayer today. And I want to invite us into a rhythm that we have been experiencing through the midday prayer breaks. As we've gathered online to, to pray daily, the body of Christ coming together to uplift each other, we have shared in the declaration of faith known as the Apostles' Creed. It is a, a marking out of the, the basic tenets of who we are as followers of Christ and what we believe as sons and daughters of the Most High God. They are a part of our faith going back centuries, and so we are enlivened by them once again. So I invite you to join with me in just a moment in the creed. But I do want to encourage you, if you have yet to lift up your joys or concerns, if you have uh, things that you would like us to be praying for in, as the body of Christ, you have a way of doing that. And I want to invite you to take advantage of that. You can send an email to a very special email address, brightonumcprayers at gmail.com. When those come in, I look at them, I, I pray for them in the moment, and then I forward them on to our prayer warriors. And we as a church family keep you in prayer throughout this week. We are praying not only for brothers and sisters here in the church, but for people who are attached from far and wide, even sister churches as they face the struggles of uh, this, uh, this time in our society. So we want to encourage you, if you have joys or concerns to lift up, please pass those along. Don't keep them to yourself. Let the body of Christ pray for you. Uh, take advantage of that. Now as we come to God in prayer, we lift up our faith in the Apostles' Creed. Join with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he comes to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now I invite us into prayer. Holy and gracious God, we come before you on this Palm Sunday singing our hosannas and knowing of the week to come, the trials that befell Jesus, the weight he bore, the sins he took for us. Lord, as we come to this time of worship, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Know, let us know that you are God. Help us to remember that we are forgiven. 
Help us to reach out, encourage beyond ourselves to those around us who need so desperately to know they are forgiven as well. They need the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, brought so long ago in which we remember this week. Lord, we lift up our joys and our concerns to you. We know that you are faithful and that you know our needs long before we would ever ask you in prayer. Lord, today we come to you in prayer and we, we ask. We ask that you would lead us by your Holy Spirit through this holy week. Fill us to overflowing with faith enough to fill those around us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, the one who taught us how to live and the one who shows us how to love and the one who brings us together as we now join in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture passage today comes appropriately from the Gospel of Matthew. In chapter 21, we're going to read verses 1 through 11. This is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, 
Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, grace be yours and peace from Jesus Christ our Lord. This is not how I imagined finishing up our series on the armor of God. When we began the series, at the beginning of Lent, we, we, uh, we, you were here. You were sitting in the pews right in front of me and I could see your faces and we could interact with one another. More than half of this series has been preached to no one. And yet, I know in my heart, and I have seen through your lovely and heartfelt notes uh, throughout the last couple of weeks, that these are getting out through social media and the internet and finding their way to you. And so, my heart is full, and my, my, uh, my spirit is glad. I am filled with joy that these messages are getting to you, and that you are uh, able to take part in them. It is... Uh, with this note, that we come to the end of this series on the armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6, 13 through 17. We've heard Paul command us, take up the whole armor of God. Well, today we round out our discussion of the armor. So far, we have uh, encountered the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. We have strapped on our shoes of peace and taken up our shield of faith. We've placed the helmet of salvation. Today, today we take a look at the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. Let's specifically look at this final verse here from Ephesians chapter 6. From our passage that outlines this armor of God in verse 17. It begins with, take up the helmet of salvation, that was last week, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, if you've been following along with this series, if you listen to the podcast or, or if you were here, for the, the first in these series, we touched on the belt of truth. The belt of truth is really the Word of God, as we understand it, the Scriptures, the truth. It is our grounding. It is the thing that we ground our entire lives, our entire faith. We, we, we ground ourselves in the Word of God. But you see, here we have in Verse 17, at the end of the armor of God, that was way back six weeks ago. But here, in the last week of our armor of God series, we have this sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, according to our translation here. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Well, which is it? 
Is the belt the word of God or is the sword of the spirit the word of God? Well, to unpack this, we're going to have to uh, learn a little ancient Greek. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? The word of God that we typically associate here with the scriptures, that Greek word is picked up by the gospel of John as a way of describing Jesus, a way of talking about Jesus. In the beginning of John, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, the Greek term that's used by John and has come to be understood to be the word of God, not only in Christ, but in the revealed word of God in scripture, is the Greek word logos. Jesus and the scriptures are the logos of God, the word of God. But that is not what Paul has for us in this verse 17 at the end of our armor of God. He says, Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But Word, in this case, is not Logos, meaning Jesus, or the Scriptures, Logos. It is the Greek word Rhema. Rhema. Now, that might not seem like a big deal to you. And, of course, we don't have two different words for word in the English language. And so when the Greek translators will give us the word became flesh and dwelt among us and the word of God as revealed in scripture in other places even in Paul the word logos and rhema distinct they are distinct for us and they describe distinct things that are going on rhema in the Greek really means God breathed it it literally refers to a living voice, the speaking, the words spoken by a living voice. And in other words, you are hearing my rhema today. They are the words that I'm speaking with my voice alive. But when referred to in the context of God, we're talking about the God-breathed, living voice of the living God, rhema. So Paul says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema of God. The God-breathed speech. The belt of truth, the, the logos or the scriptures, right? They hold everything together. The scriptures hold everything together. We've referred to this when we talked about the shield. The shield would rest on a clip that would be on the belt, Well, the same with the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit would be rested on the belt of truth. And so, both our faith in the shield and the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema of God, the God-breathed word of God, both rest on the scriptures, the logos. Rick Renner wrote a great book, Uh, that has been a a pivotal resource for me as I've put this series together, trying to dig deeply into what these elements of the armor really mean. And and he put it like this. He said that rhema is a specific word or message that the Holy Spirit quickens to our hearts and our minds at a specific time and for a special purpose. Let me just give you that one more time. The rhema is a specific word. Not a word from the scriptures, but it is a specific word or a message from the Holy Spirit quickens to our hearts and our minds at a specific time and for a special purpose. This is when God gives you that sense you should be doing something. When God gave me a call to ministry and I had thoughts in my head that seemed so practical and yet so far-fetched, that I couldn't deny they were God. That was the rhema of God. I can't find in scripture, Joel, go be a preacher. But I can find the nudging of the Holy Spirit saying, I am your God and I want you to go and declare my word to my people. 
or as it happened to me, you like working in the church, so why not make working in the church your job? And that way you don't have to compromise. Very pra practical and pragmatic, I know. But this rhema, this God-breathed, is part of what enlivens us. It, it, it builds faith in our hearts. It gives us conviction to go out and do, to step out in faith. To make that change in a job or in a, in a move somewhere new or to take on new friends or to let go of old baggage. Whatever it might be, we have that sense that God is calling us. That God is, is giving us a fresh, a fresh word, right? A specific message from the Holy Spirit that rests in our hearts and enlivens our minds and quickens our actions for a specific time and a special purpose. Now it's important for us to know that this rhema, this God-breathed word from God, can and often chooses to breathe on the logos. It's one of the beautiful ways that God works. They often work in tandem. The rhema of God, the fresh and specific word of God, breathes on the scriptures. This happens all the time when you're reading through scripture. Maybe you're in a cul-de-sac of life. Maybe you're in the midst of quarantine. Maybe you're uh, w wrestling with a, a d new decision or seeking the Lord after something different. And, and you, you look in scripture and you don't even know where to look. So you just open it up randomly and trust that God will speak to you. And you begin to read a passage of scripture and suddenly it begins to leap off the page. And that Logos gets the God breath of the Holy Spirit and it lifts out to become a specific word for you in this special time for a special purpose, whatever it may be. It, it begins to speak to you in a new way. As a preacher, I experience this often when I return to a passage of Scripture I've preached on before. Suddenly I find myself a different person with a, an additional set of experiences in a different time, speaking sometimes even to a different crowd. And when I come to the scriptures, I might see the passage and all of the places that God has breathed on it for me before, but there will be a new rhema. There'll be a new breath of God that's lifting it out for me in a new way. The best example of this is Christmas and Resurrection Sunday. There are only so many different ways we can tackle the Christmas stories or the stories that we're about to engage in this coming Holy Week. But every time I do, without exception, I find something that I didn't notice before. The Holy Spirit highlights something for me that, that God wants me to communicate, that God wants to, to rest in my heart and grow in my faith. That's Rhema. That's Rhema, the Word of God. Now it's important for us to remember that the Rhema, these specially quickened Holy Spirit encounters that, that convince us that something is the right way or the right direction or the, the new path, the Rhema must always be tested against the Logos. Think about it like this. Before we had GPS, you'd get on the highway and you'd get driving and if you were in the middle of, say, Kansas, you might not realize you were going the right way or the wrong way until you got a little ways down the path, right? Until you got down to the town and you realized that suddenly you were going the wrong direction. Or it's a little bit like if you're from Colorado, where we are here in the Brighton area. The, the standard wisdom and advice to newcomers is just put the mountains to the west. If you know that the mountains are always to the west, then you'll be okay. Now that's problematic if you're on the western slope and the mountains are on the east. But for you front range Coloradoans, you, you know what I'm talking about. The mountains are on the west. They are seen from everywhere and they orient us. They are the grounding that we have, the, the stability that we have so that we know 
that where we're oriented is where we're supposed to be going. That's what the Logos, that's what the Scripture is for us. We can get a fresh, God-breathed, Holy Spirit-led word from God. It can be a prophecy, it can be a word of knowledge, it can be something from Scripture that strikes us in a different way or gives us a different interpretation of how to look at it or how to apply it to life. But the truth is we must always test our rhema, our God-breathed Holy Spirit words from God with the logos. You see, if God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, if God is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, if God is created all space and all time and exists beyond it, if God truly is God, then what God has said in the past what God has given us as a foundation in the Logos, in the Scripture, will be consistent with what God is giving us today in Rhema. They work together, but we must test our Rhema against our Logos. We must look to the mountain that is Scripture. We must plug ourselves into the GPS and realize that God is God. We test our rhema against the Logos. Let me give you an example of this. An example from the story that sets the stage for our Holy Week experience. The, the story that enlivens our hosannas in this Palm Sunday. If you look in Matthew, we, I specifically chose Matthew because I wanted you to see how this worked. Five, five verses into this story, the author, Matthew, pauses to attribute what has just happened to a fulfillment of what had been predicted by prophets. So the scripture of Matthew's day, the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament for us Christians, was a source of prophecy that the gospel writers saw come to life in Jesus and be fulfilled in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Matthew has 14 of these throughout his gospel, and this is one of them. When, when, he send, when Jesus sends these disciples off into the upcoming village and says, go find the, the donkey and the colt, Matthew pauses in verse 4 and says, This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion to look Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on the colt the foal of a donkey. Well, he's quoting the scriptures. He's quoting actually two different prophets, Isaiah and Zechariah here, kind of mashed together. But he's quoting the scriptures and he's saying, what was the logos for them? What was the scripture, the revealed word of God to them, was now being breathed on by Rhema. It was the Holy Spirit that was lifting this passage out and say, see, this has happened because it was promised in the prophets. It's an example of the Rhema. Now, Matthew goes back and he finds these passages by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he draws the line for us very specifically in these 14 different prophetic connections that he makes throughout his gospel. He says, look, what Jesus did is connected to what was promised. Jesus is the fulfillment of the scriptures. He is the, the coming of age for these prophecies. Now, there are other examples of this, too. As we look beyond Resurrection Sunday, we, we encounter a couple of stories that bring some light to this as well. For example, the, the walk to Emmaus we're so familiar with. After the resurrection, the women come to the tomb. Later, the next scene in the Gospel of Luke is this walk to Emmaus where, where the, the risen Jesus encounters these two disciples. They don't recognize him as Jesus. He's concealed that from them somehow. And they tell Jesus why they're sad and and Jesus walks along with them on the way to Emmaus. And while he does, while he does, it says this amazing thing. It says, Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all of Scripture. That's in 
Luke 24, verse 27. He reveals to them, as they're walking along, everything from Moses to all the prophets. He helps interpret it for them in a rhema moment, in an inspiration moment. They look back on what was written, the logos, what, what God had said. And Jesus connected the dots for them and said, this is all where it's talked about me. This is where it talked about me. This is your new rhema, your new insight, your new special word. God breathed in concert with what has been said before. Now, of course, if you remember that story, Jesus ends up at dinner with these two disciples. And when he breaks the bread, they immediately begin to recognize him. And he vanishes before them. And they run from Emmaus back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples what they encountered. Well, when they get back there, Jesus appears to all of them and does the same thing. Look it up. Chapter 24 of Luke, he tells them the same thing. He reveals through Moses and the law and the prophets all that was written that spoke of Jesus. There's another profound example of this when we look even further into the story and we find in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls on the disciples gathered in the upper room And they began to speak in tongues and people around them begin to wonder if they're drunk. I always loved that passage. They begin to wonder if they're drunk and and Peter stands up to give this Holy Spirit inspired sermon for the first time. And what does he do? He quotes the prophet Joel. Your old men will see visions, your young men will dream dreams. This is what happens when the Holy Spirit falls, right? He, he quotes this passage from Joel chapter 2. He quotes the prophet and he says, This, what you have just seen, that you assume is a bunch of drunk guys in the middle of the morning, is actually the fulfillment of what God has said in his logos. And now I'm going to give it to you in a God-breathed rhema. I'm going to give you the word of God. Now we got here, we got to this point in the message examining the word, rhema, of God. But that is not the last piece of the armor, is it? This word of God, this rhema of God, is the descriptor of the actual piece of armor. The piece of armor, you'll remember from verse 17 in Ephesians 6, is the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. Peter pulls out this passage from Luke, or the prophet Joel, under the direct intervention, the the interpretation, the inspiration of the newly fallen Holy Spirit. As it grabs hold of Peter, it points him to Joel and says, this is what it meant. This is the fulfillment of this prophecy from the prophet Joel. The sword of the Spirit The rhema of God comes through the Holy Spirit, you see. Now, this sword of the Spirit is the only truly offensive weapon in the armor. There are scholars and books, even uh, even the books that I've used, that talk about the potential for interpreting some of the other elements of the armor as being offensive weapons. But when you think about it, what do we have in the what do we have in the, in the armor of God? We've got, we've got a belt. We've got a breastplate that covers the front and back. We've got shoes. Right? We've got a shield. These are all defensive. We've got a helmet. These are all defensive. These are all elements of, of the, the armor that are meant to protect the wearer, are meant to shield the wearer from the dangers of warfare. Now, you might be able to interpret the spikes on the bottom of the shoes as potential weapons if you got in a jam, or I play rugby, and so, you know, cleats are always a good weapon. It's the only thing you got besides your mouth guard. So if someone gets in your way, you just step on them, and that would be offensive, perhaps, but the truth is that the shoes are the shoes of peace. The shoes prepare us to declare the gospel of peace. So for us to assume that the shoes and their spikes were intended as an offensive weapon when Paul calls them the shoes of peace, that seems strange. 
And yet there's no denying that the sword is an offensive weapon. It is a weapon meant, yes, to defend, but it is also an offensive weapon, the only one. The key for us to remember, though, is that this sword is not any sword. This sword, this two-edged, razor-sharp sword that Paul is referring to, this sword, of the many that a Roman soldier might have used, this sword is what Paul reaches for when he wants to describe the Holy Spirit. And it means it's not ours to wield. The sword of the Spirit is something we must have. We must put on the whole armor of God, but the sword of the Spirit is not ours to wield. You see, the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Holy Spirit is the reminder that it is not we that fight, but the Spirit that fights on our behalf. We are called to rest. We are to rest in the Lord. God does the fighting. God does the fighting. As soon as we begin, as soon as we begin to to base our confidence in our ability to overcome something in life on our own ability and not in our resting in the Lord and allowing God to fight our battles, then we're lost. Then whatever we create, we'll have to sustain. Whatever we accomplish, we will have to hold on to. But when we rest in the Lord and let God through His Holy Spirit do the offense for us. When we rest in the Lord and God fights the battle. This is the perfect, this is a perfect and very familiar example of this from the, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to take a look at the Gospel of Matthew a little bit earlier. Go to Matthew chapter 4, and I, I just want to encourage you, if you haven't yet grabbed a hold of one of your Bibles, uh, you're, you have no excuse. You can't have left it at home because you're left at home. So I want you to grab a hold of your Bible and I want you to get your eyes on this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 4. We're going to read another familiar story. This is the Jesus tempted in the wilderness story. And I want to show you how this, how this uh, Logos and Rhema work together by the power of the Holy Spirit to defend us from evil. Check this out. We're familiar with the story, but it's worth reviewing. The first verse of chapter 4 begins, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. And then the tempter comes. The tempter, remember, is not tempting Jesus throughout the 40 days. He comes at the end of the 40 days when, as the gospel writer shares with us, Jesus is famished. But did you catch it? Did you catch it? In our familiarity, you might have just overlooked it entirely. It wasn't the devil who drives Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted. Jesus was led by the Spirit capital S, Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that is the sword of the Spirit. Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now that seems like a strange thing to happen. It is the Holy Spirit's leading that brings Jesus into this time of fasting. Then we get to the first challenge. The first challenge of the tempter. The tempter came... And said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Something curious about this passage, this first challenge that we must point out, is that we often mistake this first temptation as one of hunger, right? We often think of this first one as though, as though uh, the devil is tempting Jesus with food, right? like holding out a sandwich before famished teenagers, right? But, but that's not actually the temptation that the devil presents to Jesus. You see, in order to understand this one, you have to know what came right before it. If you, this is why I wanted your eyes on your own copy of God's Word. Check this out. If you go one verse up from chapter 4, verse 1, and do the last verse of chapter 3, 
you'll find yourself in the story of Jesus' baptism. And you'll remember from that story, Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he comes out of the water, he hears the voice of God. And it says to him, a voice from heaven, verse 17, said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Now listen to the first challenge by the devil. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. You see, the devil isn't tempting Jesus to eat. The devil is tempting Jesus to prove that he heard God correctly. To prove that he actually is the Son of God. When you hear the voice of God say, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And the, the first temptation of the devil is, Did God really say that? Is that really who you are? You see, the devil is attacking Jesus' identity. Now it's instructive for us. It's instructive for us to watch Jesus do his work. Check this out. Jesus answers him, it is written, ooh, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written is a reference to the scriptures, right? Is a reference to the scriptures, but in the Greek translation of the scriptures, it is not going to surprise anybody who's caught up to me already to know that Every word that comes from the mouth of God is not the logos, it's the rhema. It's the rhema of God. One does not live by bread alone, but by every rhema that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus in this one response is referring to both the logos, the scripture, and the revealed God-breathed specific word. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. He's referring to both of them while quoting scripture. Well, maybe that was just a fluke. Let's check it out, shall we? The second challenge, the second challenge starts verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the son of God, there that is again. Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. What does the devil do? He quotes the Bible at Jesus. All right, Jesus, if you're going to quote the Bible, well, I guess we're going to just quote some Bible. In this case, the devil quotes Psalm 91. Jesus, the, the devil comes to him and says, all right, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, remember, I'm not sure I'm convinced you are who God says you are, or I'm... I'm trying to get you to wonder if God really said, you are my son, the beloved. And I'm going to quote some scripture back at you. If you're going to quote scripture at me, I'm going to quote it back at you. But look what Jesus responds. God, Jesus tests the rhema against the logos. Check this out. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, the logos, do not put your Lord, the Lord your God to the test. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus comes back at him with Deuteronomy 6.16. He interprets the Logos with the Rhema. He knows that he heard from God. And even though the devil is saying, yes, but we know that you won't dash your foot. Why don't you just test it? Why don't you just see if what God said was true? Why don't you just make sure that what God said is actually what God meant? Did you hear him right? Why don't you try this? It says that if you were to fall, that you would be lifted up by angels. You would not dash a foot against the stone. And Jesus comes back and says, yes, but that would be, that would be against the logos in testing the rhema. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Well, finally, the devil's had it. The devil's had it. He's pulling out... He's pulling out his trump card. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. 
Well, the final challenge, the devil invites Jesus to give it away, to give this word of God away. Because you see, if the Son of God gives worship to the enemy of our souls, what does that do to his inheritance? It crumbles around us. If we worship the devil, we are not worshiping God. And so Jesus goes back into the scriptures one more time, back into what is written and says to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Deuteronomy 6.13. You see, the devil comes at Jesus with questions about identity. Are you really who God says you are? Comes quoting scripture to Jesus out of context, like you're going to trick the word of God with the word of God, but he tries. Finally, he just says, give it all up. Give it to me and I'll give you everything. But Jesus, secure in who he is, knowing what he must do, says, I will serve only God. I will serve only God. God, I will not give my inheritance away. When we come under attack from the enemy, we must take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema of God. The sword of the Spirit is our way of resting that God might fight our battles, that the Holy Spirit would come and defend us, would lead us to victory would be the means through which God will deliver you. When we come under attack from the enemy of our souls, we will, he will always question who you are. Are you really a child of God? He will always challenge your evidence for it. Are you sure you're saved? Are you certain that God said that? Can you be forgiven even for that? And the enemy will invite you to give it all away because he has no power over you. He knows he has no power over you. And so his only power is to trick you into giving up yours. Take up the sword of the Spirit. But here it is. You and I and all of the followers of Christ are told by Paul to take up the full armor of God. You strap on that belt of truth and ground yourself in the word of God. You put on the breastplate of righteousness, remembering who God said you are. You're going to lace up those shoes of peace and prepare yourself to declare that gospel. You're going to grab your shield of faith and allow it to absorb the fiery darts of the enemy. You're going to put on that beautiful helmet of salvation and you're going to grab the sword of the Spirit and you are going to rest while God is victorious. You're going to do it. We will rest in the Lord and watch as God delivers you time and time and time again because He is faithful. God is faithful. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. Imagine what the Father in heaven will give you, will provide for you, has entrusted to you by the power of the Holy Spirit as you follow the Son of God with whom I am well pleased. Just watch Jesus this week because you see as we enter into Holy Week, Jesus is going to be the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus is going to show us exactly how this is done, facing the worst possible circumstances, and yet coming out victorious. Amen. Are you ready for your homework? You ready for your homework? We do our homework here at Brighton United Methodist Church. I challenge you at the end of every message to take what we've talked about and apply it to your everyday lives. What I say in these messages doesn't mean a thing unless we can apply it to our lives. And so we want to apply that to our lives and we do that in our homework. We want to challenge you to do our Thirsty 30. That's 10 minutes of Bible reading, 10 minutes of prayer, 10 minutes of worship. 
but give a little more to God because it's still Lent. You're not off the hook yet. We're entering Holy Week, but give a little bit more. And if you haven't yet connected with us, I want to invite you to connect with our our uh, precious time of prayer. We do what's called the midday prayer break. We started this on Facebook. And so if, if you're watching this and you haven't connected there, just find noon, Monday through Friday at noon. I jump onto Facebook Live. You can find us right there. And we do, we do the morning prayer together. We, we pray our confessions of sin. We pray our joys and praise to God. We declare our faith in the word of God and the creeds of our faith. We pray the Lord's Prayer together and we end by declaring what is needed, by lifting our intercessory prayers to God together. It's a great time, a refreshing time. If you haven't plugged in there, do that. That would be a great way to do a little bit more this, this Lent. Uh, plug in there. But here's what I want to do for your, your special challenge for your homework this week. We're entering into Holy Week. And Holy Week in the life of a church under normal circumstances is jam-packed with extra worship. It's jam-packed with special worship services, with once-a-year customs that come together and, and help us to experience what Jesus and those disciples experience in the midst of his final week. We gather on Thursday for the Last Supper and we wash feet and we take communion. We move there into Good Friday where we remember Jesus' suffering on the cross. We hear his words and our hearts break. And then we move into a time of waiting waiting anx anxiously, waiting in anguish and mourning until Sunday, until Resurrection Sunday when we discover afresh the empty tomb. And so I want to challenge you. We're going to be doing virtual worship experiences for each of those steps through this week. They're going to go live at 7 o'clock on Thursday and on Friday, you can check back in with them all week. They'll be up. Once they're up, they're up. But I want to encourage you. You have no excuse. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. Just worship. Just live this time. Witness Jesus. Walk this path. Put on the full armor of God. And watch God go to work in the life of Jesus. Do that this week. Shall we pray? Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come before you inspired by the hosannas still ringing in our ears, and yet we look forward and we see the clouds of darkness building at the end of this week as we come to remember the crucifixion. Lord, be with us in this week. Help us to feel and know and read and hear what Jesus did. Reveal to us how the armor of God was used even by Christ. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And as we rest in you, demonstrate your glory. May we be victorious in our faith, now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to this portion of our worship experience where we would normally invite the ushers forward to receive the gifts of the congregation, what God has entrusted to us. I know in this time, it is so easy for us to look at the scarcity we go to the grocery store and we see empty shelves. We go to refill our toilet paper reserves and find it in short supply. We even find members of our own congregation whose jobs have been put at risk or even eliminated because of the, the measures that we're taking to try and promote the safety of people in our country today. But even in the midst of that, I have been overwhelmed by the generosity of God's people. I want to encourage you, if it is within your means, if you 
uh, have continued to receive abundantly from God, to share that with God through the ministries of this church. Life may be grinding to a halt, but ministry never stops. One of the best things I've seen come out of this experience is that, yes, our churches are empty, but our world is filled with people who are hungry to be the church. And so we continue in ministry with you. Our staff is working uh, tirelessly to help provide worship experiences and uh, devotions and Bible studies that you can be a part of, but also to provide you with the foundation of faith that you can use to share the grace and love of Jesus Christ with this world, wherever you are. So if you have it in your heart, find a way. You can mail your donations directly to the church. You can donate online. You can even set up a recurring payment from your bank. However you do it, I want to thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness to the ministry of this church. Keep God's ministry moving. Help us to keep the kingdom of God going forward. Gracious God, we come humbly before you knowing that everything we have is a gift from you. We pray that you would bless the gifts that are coming into this congregation, that they would be used in ministry with wisdom and compassion to help spread your gospel and build your kingdom. Lord, we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now as we go from here, let me send you with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.